Two inmates at High Desert State Prison, the largest prison in Nevada, were released into a hall on November the 12th of 2014 and started violently kicking each other while they were handcuffed. Andrew Arevalo and Carlos Manuel Perez, both in their 20s, were then fired upon with a shotgun by a trainee guard. Perez died after being shot multiple times in the head, neck, chest and arms. Arevalo was also shot and suffered similar injuries, including some from shotgun blasts to the face, but survived. Arevalo, a member of the Sorenos gang with past convictions, was declared guilty of assault, battery and Perez's murder. In spite of never touching the gun that killed him, Arevalo was sentenced to 18 months in an isolation cell known as The Hole. Representing him in the case that followed was Alexis Plunkett, who was at the time in her mid-30s. She would accuse the guards of instigating the fight to set up a gladiator-style contest and then attempting to cover it up by blaming Perez's death on Arevalo. In January of 2015, prison officials withdrew the murder and assault allegations against the gang member. He was arrested once more in 2017 after he was found with weapons and 23.7 grams of methamphetamine and was once again defended by Plunkett. She and Arevalo had known each other since 2012 and they were involved in a romantic relationship throughout the time that they were also in an attorney-client relationship. Their romance became public knowledge and Plunkett herself stated that she'd never try to hide it in spite of the fact that it eventually got her in trouble with the Nevada Attorney General's office. Arevalo was at one point caught on camera fondling Plunkett's breasts when she visited him in December of 2015 at the High Desert State Prison. In 2017, after multiple late-night visits by the lawyer to the gang member, during several of which she was recorded kissing him on the lips, staff at the Clark County Detention Center became suspicious. Surveillance was set up in the visitation room and Plunkett was captured allowing Arevalo to use her cell phone, which was forbidden. The lawyer was also reported to have allowed Rogelio Estrada, another inmate she represented, to do the same. Plunkett was arrested on 12 counts of unlawful possession of a portable telecommunication device by a felony jail prisoner and two gross misdemeanor counts of conspiracy. Plunkett maintained that she'd given her phone to Arevalo and Estrada to make calls regarding bail, which she thought was allowed. The lawyer called the case against her a witch hunt on social media and on May the 31st of 2017, defiantly posted a photo on Facebook of Arevalo kissing her on the cheek. She also posted a photo of her mugshot and wrote, Facing charges, I got you in a way another attorney cannot, before giving out her phone number and asking people to call her. In March of 2019, Plunkett pleaded guilty to one count of possession of a telecommunication device by a prisoner in a plea deal that saw her being sentenced to three years probation. The woman was subsequently banned from practicing law in Nevada. She and Arevalo eventually broke up and in August of 2019, the latter was sentenced to up to eight years in prison for his drug and weapons possession offenses. Number 16. Brandon and Paul Labiner leading up to early 2022. Florida lawyers Brandon Labiner and his father Paul had enjoyed a good personal and professional relationship working together at the latter's Boca Raton's office. At some point, Brandon accepted a foreign check and wired $100,000 to a client without doing proper verifications, resulting in a loss of the money. In order to cover up for the mistake, Brandon was alleged to have started funneling money from his father's accounts into his own, in effect stealing from the firm which Paul had started in the 1980s. The duo's relationship deteriorated and reached a boiling point when Brandon assaulted his father in May of 2022. 
injuring his shoulder, the younger Labina was forced to resign from the firm in September of that year. Then in 2023, Paul filed a police complaint against Brandon, accusing him of stealing $450,000 from a trust fund in the name of his mother, Mindy. The theft allegation led to Brandon being disbarred and in May, Paul filed a civil suit against him over the trust fund dispute. On July the 1st of 2023, a vehicle registered to Brandon was seen driving in the area of the Boca Raton office where he'd no longer worked for nearly a year. About an hour later, a man, whom the police later identified as Brandon, rode up to Paul's office on a bike. He carried a drawstring bag before removing a box that contained a gun. Brandon waited for roughly 40 minutes for his father to emerge and then gunned him down. 68-year-old Paul died after he was shot in the head and chest, as well as twice in the lower body. Brandon was tracked down by the authorities to a nearby building and arrested on murder charges after a brief standoff. In mid-November, Brandon was found dead in his cell at the Palm Beach County Jail. According to his lawyer, aside from his legal proceedings, he'd been battling a series of personal problems, which included a pending divorce and the recent death of his only child, who was still born at 39 weeks. Number 15. Donald Deskins In late August of 2023, a lawyer and prosecutor from Kentucky was arrested for the murder of his wife. 54-year-old Donald Deskins was charged with committing murder in the course of domestic violence and tampering with physical evidence for an incident that had occurred on April the 24th of 2021. On that day, Deskins' wife, 46-year-old Judith, died from blunt force trauma inside their home. The lawyer reportedly tampered with physical evidence on that date and also on July the 28th of 2021, when he gave his laptop to officials to use in the investigation around the same time, which was roughly three months after his wife's death. Deskins announced on Facebook that he was in a new relationship Congratulatory comments followed as to the rest of the world. The lawyer was a great man, moving on with his life after a personal tragedy. Following his indictment, it was determined that Deskins wouldn't be prosecuted by Pike County Commonwealth's attorney's office, given his former employment there as an assistant prosecutor. Johnson County Commonwealth's attorney, Floyd Skeens, was named as the special prosecutor in charge of his case. He explained the delay in Deskins' arrest by saying that finding the person with the skills and expertise to be able to interpret the physical evidence took forever. As of the latest information available on the matter, Deskins was held without bond at the Pike County Detention Center. Number 14. Beatrice Bijou 31-year-old Florida-based personal injury lawyer Beatrice Bijou was driving through Stewart in February of 2022. Upon reaching the Fresh Market on Southeast Ocean Boulevard, Bijou mounted the sidewalk while driving at roughly 35 miles per hour. She made no attempt to slow down and plowed into a crowd, striking four people. CCTV recorded her reversing her vehicle at a high rate of speed before trying to run over another pedestrian. All of the victims survived with various injuries. According to an arrest report obtained by the Miami Herald, Bijou instantly admitted her actions to the arresting officers, stating that voices in her head had told her to kill the people. The woman revealed in further statements to the police that she'd been diagnosed with mental health disorders in 2019 and had been receiving medication for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Bijou was held without bond after pleading not guilty to one count of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, one count of high-speed or wanton fleeing, and four counts of attempted murder. Later in the year, she was found not guilty by way of insanity and committed to a secure mental health facility. In the verdict's aftermath, two of her victims, Holly Maneo and her mother, Liz Maguire, spoke to the media. Maneo reported that they'd been left with injuries and that the incident was still on her mind every day, while Maguire urged Bijou to accept the help which had been offered to her. 
number 13. Francine Blair Bogomil. On April the 30th of 2020, a Florida lawyer caused chaos at the home of her former husband by crashing her SUV into his garage and physically assaulting him. 40-year-old Francine Blair Bogomil left her children aged 5 and 11 alone at her house and then drove to her ex's Orange County address. She plowed her Land Rover into his stationary GMC Yukon and launched into the garage. The force of the impact reportedly pushed the door two to three feet inward. Bogomil's ex-husband came outside to find her throwing objects at his girlfriend's BMW and smashing the vehicle's windows. The lawyer charged the other woman, but her former husband got between them. The man was slapped twice by Bogomil, at which point he retaliated with a slap of his own. An Orange County Sheriff's deputy arrived at the scene and attempted to stop Bogomil from shouting threats at her ex's girlfriend. She refused to do so and spat on the deputy. Bogomil was taken into custody and days after posting bond, she violated a restraining order by contacting her ex and his girlfriend. She threatened to ruin the former's life and to go after his girlfriend's family if she didn't stay away from her children. Bogomil was charged with multiple counts that included aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, assault on a law enforcement officer, domestic violence battery, and criminal mischief. She pleaded no contest and was sentenced to 51 weeks in jail, while a judge recommended she be permanently disbarred. Number 12. Jennifer Emmy. In August of 2021, a Colorado animal rights lawyer was sentenced to 10 years in prison for solicitation, retaliation against the witness or victim, and stalking. The charges stemmed from a campaign of abuse that 43-year-old Emmy had led against her estranged husband and his girlfriend, while she and the former were locked in a divorce battle. It was a publicized fall from grace for the lawyer whose work with animals had turned her into a media celebrity. There had been multiple instances of aggressive and volatile behavior on Emmy's behalf, dating back to January of 2020. Some of the lowest points included holding a knife to her husband's throat and threatening to drive a tractor trailer into one of their children. Emmy's campaign culminated with her trying to hire a hitman to kill her husband's girlfriend, who'd worked as an au pair for the couple. In November of 2020, she started talking to 28-year-old Timothy Lindsay, a ranch hand at her Evergreen property, and asked if he knew someone who could get rid of the woman. Lindsay played along and assumed the role of broker for the nefarious affair. Emmy offered up the purported target's name and workplace, claiming that money wouldn't be a problem even after Lindsay had told her it may cost up to $100,000. She also suggested killing her husband as well by disguising the hit as a car accident. Lindsay alerted the authorities who initiated a six-month-long operation focused on Emmy. It came to include extortion attempts, blackmail, and undercover meetings before the lawyer was booked into Jefferson County Jail and subsequently sentenced. Number 11. Aruj Rahman and Collinford Mattis Two New York lawyers each pleaded guilty to a single count of possessing or making a destructive device in October of 2021, in a case that involved the throwing of a Molotov cocktail. Following the death of George Floyd, protests erupted in many areas of the US, including Brooklyn, Yuruj Rahman, a tenant rights lawyer in the Bronx, and Collinford Mattis, an associate at Prior Cashman, had taken part in the street demonstrations in May of 2020. Rahman threw a gasoline-filled bottle into an empty NYPD vehicle and then fled in a minivan driven by Mattis. Rahman was also reported to have attempted distributing Molotov cocktails to other protesters. Her lawyer argued that she and Mattis didn't deserve to be imprisoned as they'd acted in the heat of the moment during one of the most turbulent nights in modern American history. However, because an explosive device was involved, they were investigated under a law that viewed them as a threat to national security. The pair, both in their 30s, each faced up to 10 years in prison and accepted that the guilty plea would likely result in them being disbarred. Number 10. Keegan Harros In 2020, Oklahoma City defense attorney Keegan Harros, aged 37, was connected to a triple homicide which had occurred in September of the previous year. Tiffany Icor, aged 43, was gunned down at her residence near Beggs along with her parents, Jack and Evelyn K. Chandler, both in their 60s. At the time, Harrows was defending Barry Titus in a felony domestic assault case against Icor. In 2017, only a few months after they'd started dating, 
Titus was accused of beating and strangling her, which caused the woman to file for a protective order against him. At some point, Harrows and her client became romantically involved and it's believed that she'd had an active role in the shooting. Surveillance footage from Eichel's residence showed two masked intruders approaching the house on foot, one of whom was very tall and described as obviously male by the authorities, while the other was much smaller. They'd pulled up near the home in a vehicle, the description of which matched Harris's 2010 Lexus sedan. The intruders cut the power supply before breaking down the door and shooting the three victims multiple times with two different caliber weapons. Harrows pleaded guilty to federal weapons charges after an AR-15 rifle, believed to have been used in the triple killing, was found in her possession. Harrows was sentenced to two years in prison on the weapons charge, and it remains to be determined if she'll be convicted for the murders as well. Number 9. Murdor Family From 1920 to 2006, three members of the Murdor family consecutively served as district attorney in a five-county district of South Carolina that aptly became known as Murdor County. Sion, Alex Murdor, was a lawyer at the family's firm but didn't continue down the path of his great-grandfather, grandfa and father as South Carolina's top prosecutor. Starting in 2019, a series of events with Murdor at their core would send shockwaves through the state and eventually cast aspersions on the family's relationship with its judicial system. In February, Murdor's underage son Paul caused a boat crash that resulted in the death of 19-year-old Mallory Beach. Paul wasn't given a field sobriety nor was he booked into jail or even handcuffed. His blood alcohol at the time was reportedly almost three times the legal limit for operating a motor vehicle. Witnesses offered virtually no usable information for fear of the family's influence. On June the 7th of 2021, Murdor called the police to report he'd found the bodies of his wife, Maggie, aged 52, and 22-year-old Paul. They'd been shot multiple times and with different weapons outside the family's hunting lodge in Islandton. Murdor's alibi was that he'd been spending time with his terminally ill father and his mother, a dementia sufferer. The South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, or SLED, revealed in October of 2021 that Murdor had always been a suspect, but didn't comment further. Murdor would eventually be forced to resign from his family's firm after allegedly mishandling funds worth millions of dollars. A day later, on September the 4th of 2021, he was shot in the head while changing a tire on the side of the road. It would later be revealed that Murdor himself had hired a former client to execute him so that Buster, his other son, would get his $10 million life insurance. Murdor sustained only a superficial wound and was arrested on pending fraud charges. In the aftermath of his wife and son's murder, SLED launched an investigation into the 2015 death of Stephen Smith, a high school classmate of Buster, and into the 2018 death of Murdor's housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield. 19-year-old Smith was found dead on a rural road from blunt force trauma, while Satterfield was reported to have tripped and fallen, but was never autopsied or examined by a coroner. Allegations of a Murdor cover-up marred both incidents. Number 8. Kent Morhini 50-year-old Connecticut woman Jennifer Dallos was last seen on May the 24th of 2019. A few years earlier, Dallos had filed for divorce from her husband, Fotis, and their tumultuous separation as well as custody proceedings were ongoing at the time of her disappearance. During their marriage, Fotis had begun having an affair with his colleague, Michelle Traconis. As the investigation progressed, evidence indicated that Fotis and Traconis had been responsible for Dallas's murder and they were both arrested. A DNA sample for blood found at Dollis's home was a match to both the victim and her estranged husband, indicating that she'd been assaulted. Fotis and Draconis were captured by surveillance cameras dumping garbage bags in 30 bins around Hartford. Some of them were found to contain clothes and cleaning items with blood on them that was confirmed as Dollis's. Fotis, initially arrested for tampering with evidence, was charged with capital murder on January the 7th of 2020 and Traconis was charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Later that month, while out on bail and awaiting trial, 52-year-old Fortis took his own life via carbon monoxide poisoning, leaving behind a note claiming that he refused to spend time in jail for a crime he didn't commit. Further revelations followed, implicating Fortis's attorney and longtime friend Kent Morhini in the conspiracy. The authorities believed He'd been working with Fotis and Traconis to provide an alibi for them the day Dollis went missing. 
Additionally, a shallow grave, bags of lime, and a blue tarp were discovered on a secluded property that the lawyer owned. It's been proposed that the grave had been dug for Dollis, but no human remains were discovered inside, as the police searched it with cadaver dogs. Dollis's body was never found. Morhini was charged with conspiracy to commit murder and initially held on a $2 million bond, but it was subsequently reduced. In October of 2020, he was released with a GPS ankle monitor and lost his legal license in the scandal's wake. According to speculative updates on the case, Morhini was believed to have become a key witness for the prosecution's efforts against Traconis. Number 7. Reagan Younger Florida lawyer Reagan Younger was arrested in March of 2021 as the main suspect in a fatal shooting that had occurred in early November of the previous year. 42-year-old Younger had been closely watched by law enforcement after a victim, whose identity remained undisclosed, was gunned down at the Sheraton Hotel in Maitland. The incident was described as a drug deal gone awry. Orange County deputies decided to move in for the arrest after noticing Younger and another woman loading bags into a Honda Civic with Tennessee plates outside her office. As the authorities searched the bags, they recovered a loaded 9mm handgun, several grams of methamphetamine, smoking pipes, and a pink scale. Younger's case is ongoing, but according to updates, there were witnesses and material evidence placing her at the scene and pointing to her as the shooter. American lawyer Roy Den Hollander was a self-admitted anti-feminist and a men's rights activist who'd filed a string of lawsuits against ladies' night promotions at various nightclubs and bars. He also sued Columbia University for incorporating women's studies classes. His lawsuits were largely unsuccessful and openly mocked by those he sought to oppose. In 2015, he represented plaintiffs challenging the constitutionality of the male-only draft in the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey. Judge Esther Sellas allowed the case to proceed to court but was against some of Hollander's arguments. He later came to believe that she was purposefully stalling out of political motivation. Hollander had also been part of the National Coalition for Men, or the NCFM, before he was kicked out following a disagreement with fellow members, including lawyer Mark Angelucci. Hollander was said to have perceived Angelucci as a rival and held a grudge against him. Evidence suggests that following a terminal cancer diagnosis in 2019, Hollander launched a campaign to eliminate his perceived enemies. On July the 11th of 2020, Angelucci went to the front door of his home in Cedar Pines Park, California, after being told that a package had arrived for him. A man dressed as a delivery worker then executed him at point-blank range. Angelucci was pronounced dead at the scene. Eight days later, Judge Esther Salas was in the basement of her home in New Jersey when a gunman arrived at her residence. Her 20-year-old son, David, was shot dead. Salas' husband, Mark, also suffered multiple gunshot wounds and was left in critical condition but survived. A man in a FedEx uniform was spotted in the neighborhood at the time of the attack, but he couldn't be confirmed as the shooter. 72-year-old Hollander's lifeless body was found the following day in upstate New York, and it was determined he died of a gunshot wound. A car rented in his name was discovered on the same road as his body, and it contained a list of targets that included Salas, Angelucci, and an oncologist who'd treated him. The Walther semi-automatic handgun he'd used matched the caliber of the weapons used on Angelucci and Salas' family. Hollander was identified as the primary subject in both shootings. Number 5. Todd Macaluso From 2009 to 2010, Todd Macaluso represented Casey Anthony in what Time magazine dubbed the social media case of the century. Anthony faced the death penalty after being charged with the murder of her own child which prosecutors argued she'd done to free herself from parental responsibility. In 2011, Casey was found not guilty of first-degree murder, aggravated child abuse, and aggravated manslaughter of a child, which triggered public outrage. Following her acquittal, Macaluso reportedly used his private jet to fly her out of Orlando. In November of 2015, Macaluso was given heavy fines and sentenced to five months in jail after pleading guilty to wire fraud in California. Without his clients' knowledge, he'd put up their personal injury cases as collateral, forging their signatures to enter funding agreements with investors. He was disbarred in 2016. While out on supervised release, 
that same year, Macaluso was involved in another high-profile case, only not as a legal representative, but as a suspected drug smuggler. He was charged with taking part in an international trafficking conspiracy that involved transporting roughly 3,000 pounds of cocaine aboard his Falcon 10 private jet. According to the prosecution, he'd repeatedly met with drug distributors in Tijuana, Mexico. In November of 2016, he flew to Haiti and was expected to transport the drugs the day after his arrival. The plan was to take them to Honduras, from where they'd be sold to Mexican dealers and imported in the US. Once the drop-off was complete, Macaluso was supposed to receive $200,000. According to federal agents, the plot was uncovered after his name came up while investigators were looking at drug traffickers planning to use planes registered in the US. Macaluso never made it out of Haiti as he was arrested alongside two accomplices. The former lawyer was extradited to the US where he was ultimately sentenced to 15 years in prison in addition to a $10,000 fine. Number 4. Thomas Lowe In August of 2011, lawyer Thomas Lowe, a man in his late 50s, met a client whose identity wasn't released to discuss the possibility of representing her in a divorce. Lowe, who worked out of an office in Burnsville, Minnesota, then preyed on the woman's vulnerability. During a phone call with her several days later, he complimented her on her appearance, asked intimate questions about her marriage life and asked if she was interested in him. They went on to have an affair while Lowe acted as her attorney. Perhaps most shocking of all, Lowe billed the woman on the dates they met to have intercourse. They were registered at meetings or drafting memos, reportedly amounting to nearly $1,000. In what was reported as an attempt to save his own marriage, Lowe broke it off with the client and two days later also withdrew as her lawyer. The woman, with a history of abuse and mental health treatment, attempted to take her own life in the aftermath. She revealed the affair while recovering in the hospital. Lowe initially denied it but eventually unconditionally admitted to the transgression. On January the 10th of 2013, the Supreme Court of Minnesota ruled that he be suspended indefinitely. Number 3. Michael Avenatti In one of the more high-profile cases of his career, lawyer Michael Avenatti represented adult film actress Stephanie Clifford, professionally known as Stormy Daniels, in the scandal with former US President Donald Trump. Daniels had attempted to go public on an affair she'd allegedly had with Trump in 2006. In the final days of the 2016 presidential election, she was paid $130,000 by Trump's lawyer, Michael Cohen, to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Avenatti then represented Daniels in March of 2018 in a lawsuit seeking to invalidate the NDA. He also represented her in a defamation lawsuit against Trump, which was ultimately dismissed. Later, Daniels would claim that the lawyer had filed the suit against her wishes and he was also accused of embezzling $300,000 from her. Avenatti capitalized on the attention from the case and went on what was described as a publicity tour, making over 100 TV appearances and commenting on the case on social media. In March of 2019, Daniels terminated her arrangement with him. That same month, he was arrested in New York City for trying to extort $25 million out of shoe and athletic apparel company Nike. On the 25th, he was taken into custody 15 minutes after announcing that he'd hold a press conference the following day to reveal a scandal involving the company that related to high school and college basketball players. On the 25th in the afternoon, Avenetti and an unnamed accomplice were meant to meet lawyers from Nike after reportedly offering to cancel the conference in exchange for payment. He was ultimately found guilty on three counts of attempted extortion and in July of 2021, sentenced to 30 months in prison. We will line up our release about when straight A students go wrong right after number one. Stick around if you'd like to watch that episode as well still. Number one, Richard Merritt. In January of 2019, disgraced and disbarred lawyer Richard Merritt was sentenced to 15 years in prison and another 15 on probation for stealing from over a dozen of his clients in Cobb County, Georgia. 44-year-old Merritt was found guilty on 34 counts of theft and exploitation. He admitted to settling civil lawsuits behind his clients' backs 
forging their signatures on official documents and then keeping the money intended for them. Roughly 17 of his clients were affected by Merritt's actions that resulted in him stealing over $450,000, which he reportedly used to buy a Porsche and pay for lavish holidays. After his sentencing, Merritt was given two weeks to get his affairs in order, after which he was meant to turn himself in on February the 1st. Merritt didn't surrender to face justice for his crimes and instead cut off his ankle monitor and went on the run. U.S. Marshals headed to a Stone Mountain home in DeKalb County on February the 2nd to retrieve him. They arrived to find that his mother, 77-year-old Shirley, had been brutally murdered. She'd been bludgeoned and stabbed to death, with Merritt subsequently becoming the main suspect in her killing. He was also reported to have stolen his mother's Lexus SUV as he fled from the law. A nationwide manhunt was launched, with U.S. Marshals warning the public not to engage Merritt as he was to be considered armed and dangerous. There were concerns that he'd seek revenge on his former clients who'd pressed charges against him. After around eight months, he was found near a thrift shop in Tennessee and arrested without incident. A DeKalb County grand jury indicted him for the murder and assault of his mother. According to updates on the case, he was still awaiting a trial date. In August of 2021, teenager Gisela Castro Medina was arrested in Fort Walton Beach, Florida on charges of human trafficking involving commercial acts of an intimate nature. A Florida judge unsealed an indictment that named her as a co-defendant in a Minnesota case that involved recruiting girls for political donor Anton Tony Lozado. The latter, at the time, in his early 30s, was a former campaign manager who'd given nearly $200,000 to various Minnesota Republicans. Content across his social media profiles depicted him living a lavish lifestyle that included luxury vehicles, trips on private planes, and socializing with high-ranking politicians. Medina was a star student and the University of St. Thomas College Republicans chair. She was also part of the Pre-Law Society, St. Thomas Film Society, Hispanic Organization for Leadership and Advancement, as well as the Business Law Club. She pleaded guilty to her role in the conspiracy in 2022 and in March of the following year, testified against Lazaro at his trial. Medina revealed that she'd met the man in 2020 through Seeking Arrangements, a sugar daddy website. They had intimate relations in exchange for money before Lazaro then asked Medina to recruit other teenagers to do the same, which he described to her as a type of matchmaking. She initially refused, but ultimately changed her mind and reached out to teenagers on Snapchat, receiving hundreds of dollars for every girl she sent to Lazaro. Medina stated in court that the man wanted broken girls who had to be underage, white, petite, and without tattoos. The prosecution showed screenshots of messages between Medina and Lazaro, as well as between the former and the girls she'd contacted. It would also emerge that in some cases, the victim's silence was secured by Lazaro through his lawyer and non-disclosure agreements. After the FBI had raided Lazaro's luxury Minneapolis condo, he paid Medina's rent as well as her tuition bill and gave her tens of thousands of dollars in an effort to dissuade her from talking to the authorities. During his trial, Lazaro admitted to having relations with the girls but denied recruiting them. He was nevertheless found guilty on seven counts of trafficking in late March of 2023. Number 6. Grace Smith A straight-A student from Laramie High School in Wyoming was arrested in the fall of 2021 for refusing to wear a mask on school grounds. Grace Smith had previously been suspended for not wearing a face covering as mandated by the district to prevent the spreading of COVID-19. She and other students had been protesting the mandate since it went into effect on September the 8th. Following her two-day suspension, Smith returned to school maskless and refused to leave the cafeteria. She would later tell a media outlet, I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. I wanted to go back to class just so I could learn. Her actions resulted in a school-wide lockdown and law enforcement being called on the premises. A video that Smith later uploaded showed her being placed in handcuffs and escorted off school grounds on charges of trespassing. In the aftermath, the teen's father, Andrew, voiced his support for her while criticizing county and state officials for not getting involved to support her civil liberties as guaranteed by the state's constitution. Smith and her family filed a lawsuit against the governor, health officials, and others, alleging that Wyoming had extended its public health emergency related to the pandemic longer than needed in order to obtain federal money. Several other plaintiffs joined in the legal action. Updates from the spring of 2022, however, indicated that the suit had been dismissed 
by a federal judge. Number five, Mark Gerson. On December the 1st of 2011, Mark Gerson was arrested by the Metropolitan Police Department outside a hotel in Washington, D.C., where he and others were packaging and storing copious amounts of crystal meth and amphetamine. Gerson, at the time in his late 20s, was leading a double life. He was a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, a straight-A student at Georgetown Law School and a member of its Phi Beta Kappa fraternity. Concurrently, he was a functioning meth addict and a drug dealer who'd traveled to California to buy methamphetamine, which he'd shipped back to Washington, D.C. Also involved in the bi-coastal drug ring was Gerson's roommate, 30-year-old Michael Talon, who was arrested and charged as well. The packages that they and other accomplices regularly sold ranged from an ounce to half a pound. Gerson was reported to have earned upwards of $100,000 in the illegal operation. Communication with his dealers and customers indicated that Gerson felt he was capable of evading detection and law enforcement because of his intellectual ability. He ultimately pleaded guilty to conspiracy to distribute and possess with intent to distribute methamphetamine. He was sentenced to four years in prison followed by three years of supervised release. In order to forfeit his illegally obtained funds in addition to paying a $2,500 fine, the sentencing judge stated in court that he found it perplexing how someone as gifted and intelligent as Gerson had gotten involved in the drug trade. Number 4. Luke Christian Dollarhite The high school student from Utah launched a vicious attack on five of his peers on November the 15th of 2016 as he reportedly sought to experience killing as many people as possible before he died. The incident took place in the locker room of Mountain View High School in Orem. As students were preparing for a morning physical education class, Luke Christian Dollarhite was a straight-A student with no prior disciplinary issues. He initially struck one teen in the head with a wooden bow staff and with such force that the staff broke in two. Dollarhite then brandished a three-inch blade and stabbed four others in their necks and torsos. He was eventually surrounded by school staff and shot with a taser by responding police officers. None of the victims were identified, but all of those involved in the mass stabbing, dollar height included, survived with various injuries. Two of the victims were left in critical condition in the immediate aftermath. Upon being taken into custody, Dollar Height told law enforcement that he'd wanted to live out his murderous fantasies and had selected his victims at random, adding that he'd worn red expecting to be drenched in blood. Further harrowing details of Dollar Height's conversation with the police included the teen speaking freely about how easily the knife had gone in his victim and that he'd been able to attack more people than expected. In April of 2017, he reached a deal with prosecutors in which he pleaded guilty to one count of attempted aggravated murder in adult court and four other counts in juvenile court. He was sentenced to 10 years to life in prison, which he'd serve after the conclusion of his sentence in the juvenile system at the age of 21. In a parole hearing from 2021, Dollar Height reported that he'd been dealing with extreme depression at the time of the attack and that he'd since benefited from treatment and from corresponding with the family of one of his victims. Number 3. Eutimio Rodriguez A former class valedictorian from George Washington High School in Chicago was arrested in late November of 2010 for unlawful use of a weapon. 18-year-old Eutimio Rodriguez walked into his former school and told security officers that he was going to see a teacher but it emerged that he didn't have an appointment. Rodriguez was detained after walking through a metal detector. He was searched and officers found a pistol in an ankle holster on him, which he claimed to be carrying for protection. Law enforcement was called to the scene and they found that the 38 caliber pistol, which was loaded with six bullets, had been reported stolen in Indiana. Rodriguez was also found to be in possession of rubber gloves and a list of the names of a Chicago police tactical team which had recently conducted a drug raid in the far south side Hegowitz neighborhood. Rodriguez was arrested and held on a $10,000 bond while his intentions with the gun at the school and beyond remained unclear. Number 2. Joel Ortiz a former Boston High School valedictorian became the first person in the US to be convicted for the crime of sim swapping in late January of 2019. Massachusetts student Joel Ortiz was indicted on 28 charges that included multiple counts of identity theft, hacking and grand theft. 
SIM swapping involves a criminal tricking a telephone provider into transferring the target's phone number to a SIM card in their control. It thus enables them to break into accounts that use said phone number for authentication. Ortiz employed the scam to target cryptocurrency accounts and steal over $5 million from at least 40 victims. In one instance, in March of 2018, he stole over a million dollars from a Cupertino crypto entrepreneur. Ortiz reportedly spent some of the money on luxury clothing and accessories, lavish club outings, and to be flown with his friends to a music festival via helicopter. An investigation into the thefts was launched after one of the victims, an investor involved in blockchain projects, reported that his phone was hacked. Investigators then served warrants to AT&T and Google. After searching through several email accounts, they found a photo of Ortiz holding up his ID. He was arrested at the Los Angeles International Airport while reportedly on his way to Europe. Ortiz pleaded guilty to multiple felony theft charges on January the 24th of 2019 in a deal that eventually saw him sentenced to 10 years in prison. Investigators were able to recover roughly $400,000 from him as the rest of the ill-gotten gains had either been spent or hidden. Number 1. Haley Dykeman On May the 14th of 2021, Haley Dykeman of Belle Chase, Louisiana, was found unresponsive by her family who consequently called law enforcement and the Plaquemines Parish Emergency Medical Services to their home. A second teenager whose identity wasn't revealed was also discovered unresponsive at the scene the previous night. The teens had gone to the apartment of 22-year-old drug dealer Franklin Senfless. He sold them a single pill of what he claimed was a Percocet derivative, when it was actually fentanyl. The teens returned to Dykeman's home and each took half, but the situation went horribly wrong, as both suffered the effects of acute fentanyl toxicity. Dykeman's friend survived, but she did not. She died on her parents' 20th wedding anniversary. The Bell Chase High School senior was an honor roll student, and her passing occurred only days from her graduation. Senfles was later arrested and reportedly admitted to law enforcement that he'd known what the pill truly was. He was charged with second-degree murder and second-degree attempted murder. Senfles eventually pleaded guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter on September the 6th of 2022 and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. Thanks for watching. 